Good morning, everyone. My name is Lisa Diver. I'm one of the gynecologic oncologists here at Stanford. And today I'm going to talk to you about a uh, screening for uterine cancer and ovarian cancer. Who uh, we might do that for, why, and what that would involve. No disclosures. OK, so here's a little bit about how we're going to break down today. First, we're going to go over what is a screening test, what does that actually mean, and what diseases are appropriate for screening and what aren't. We're going to go over what our governing organizations say about screening for ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer. We'll talk a little bit about the data that guides those recommendations. And then we'll talk about who might actually be appropriate for screening for this and try and draw some conclusions. OK, so what is a screening test? So that's actually sort of an interesting question if you ask yourself sort of what does that mean to get screened for something. And I think this is a really good definition from Johns Hopkins. A screening test is done to detect potential health disorders or diseases in people who do not have any symptoms. So that's true screening, right? You are feeling absolutely well, and you're going to the doctor to get a test anyway to see if you might have something. Or to detect it early enough to treat it most effectively. Screening tests are not considered diagnostic. So if you have a positive screening test, like we all know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have the disease, right? We talked about all those false positive mammograms in that talk earlier today. And so we're looking to identify a subset of the population who should have additional diagnostic testing. So that's really what a screening test is. So what are the characteristics of a good screening test? So first, a screening test should be low cost. Right? So this is going to be something we're applying to broad populations of healthy people. It needs to be reasonably priced. It needs to be easy to perform. It can't be too invasive or challenging. It should be acceptable to the population. So those people who are the target of the screening test should not really mind getting it. And then finally, it needs to be reasonably accurate. So you've heard the words primary prevention and other things batted around today, and this is actually what they mean. And we can use screening tests, perhaps, or other tests at various stages in in how we think about disease prevention. So primary prevention is to reduce the risk in asymptomatic people. So like vaccines fit into this category, right? The HPV vaccine prevents cervical cancer in, as in asymptomatic people. Secondary prevention is to hopefully detect and uh, treat precancerous changes. So that would be like when you get a colposcopy for your cervical cancer. You get a biopsy that has a precancer, and you can treat it before you get to cervical cancer, but maybe you're not asymptomatic. And then tertiary prevention is actually maybe you already have cervical cancer or something else, but we're going to catch it early to decrease the morbidity of that. And so that's not quite screening in the same way, right? Um, but we can try interventions at different stages along the prevention pathway to try and figure out what's going to be best. And that's going to vary based on what diseases we use. So what are the features of the cancer, not just the features of the test, that might make it amenable to screening? So first, it needs to have a high incidence of affected people. And the reason for this, like we talked about, is that not all positive screening tests mean people actually have disease. And the more people in the population that have the disease, the more likely that the screening test is positive means a true positive. That's called a positive predictive value. So you need to have a high enough incidence in your population to make the screening effective. It needs to be feasible to enact at the population level. There should be, in theory, some sort of period of pre-invasion, something that you can catch before it's spread or metastasized, such that catching it early actually makes a difference. No point in catching something if it didn't make any difference to catch it before the patient had symptoms, right? You want to change their outcome. So in theory, it should be sort of slow growing. And we need to see that clinical benefit. So these are the top uh, cancers diagnosed in the United States. And what you can see is that the first three in men, prostate, lung, and colon, and the first three in women, breast, lung, and colon, all have some sort of screening, right? So these things are high enough incidence in our population that screening seems to matter. And that isn't going to be necessarily true for ovarian cancer, as we'll see. So ovarian cancer, the incidence is about 1 in 70 in the US for women. It's not even in the top 10, right? So we're not talking about a high incidence. It doesn't really clearly have a pre-invasive lesion. So we're not doing a good job on our checklist of diseases that sort of make are amenable to screening. We don't really know how fast it grows, but we know it usually presents at an advanced stage, and the symptoms present late. Um, it would definitely clearly benefit from early detection. We know that women who have ovarian cancer caught early at stage one do much better than women caught at stage three or four, as most women are. But there's no clear feasible screening, and we'll talk about some of this data. Endometrial cancer, alternatively, is high incidence in women, about 4% of the US population. It makes that top five. All right, so it's common in the population. It has a known pre-invasive lesion. There's a hyperplasia. That's a pre-invasive endometrial lesion. 
It's likely slow growing because we catch most of it at early stage. Most people have symptoms. They have some postmenopausal bleeding. It's an early symptom. So the question is really, does it benefit from early detection? If we're already catching women and curing them because they're coming in with early stage disease due to bleeding, would screening them even change? Would it really make a difference? We're already catching these women at stage one and curing them. So perhaps screening them for that wouldn't make a huge difference in their clinical outcomes. Screening for this, unfortunately, has been poorly studied. All right, so what do the governing organizations say about screening? We heard about the category B and C recommendations for breast cancer screening earlier today. So the Society for Gynecologic Oncology has participated in the Choosing Wisely campaign, which is a campaign by the American Board of Internal Medicine to sort of basically task organizations to pick a few key interventions that are going to improve medical care, reduce harm, and possibly reduce cost. And the number one recommendation from the SGO for choosing wisely is not to screen low-risk women with CA125, that's a blood test, or an ultrasound for ovarian cancer. And the reason for this is that they say that false positive results of either test lead to unnecessary procedures, and they don't seem to think it's helpful. All right, so that's one recommendation against it. The American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology similar, similarly says that the existing evidence does not support any test to effectively screen for ovarian cancer. And so uh, they also think that we shouldn't be screening asymptomatic low-risk women. And finally, the U.S. Preventative Service Task Force says that screening asymptomatic low-risk women for ovarian cancer is a category D, not recommended. Not to be considered, not to be discussed with your doctor, but actually not recommended. And this was updated as recently as this year, 2018. What about endometrial cancer? So there's a lot less data here, and so no sort of firm recommendations about endometrial cancer screening, um, but there is no society that I know of that actively recommends screening asymptomatic low-risk women for endometrial cancer. And there is a statement joint by the American College of OBGYN, as well as the Society for Gynecologic Oncology, that clearly state that there's no available recommended screening test to identify endometrial cancer. So why is this, right? I mean, we like screening for cancer. We, help, we like to prevent cancer. We want our women to do well. And as a GYN oncologist who takes care of women with uterine and ovarian cancer, I would love to put myself out of a job and screen all these patients away and not have to treat this. Um, so you know, why do we have these recommendations? Have we even tried to screen these women? And is that helpful? So we have. I'm going to walk you through just a couple large studies that have been done. Uh, this is the first one called the Prostate, Lung, uh, Colorectal, and Ovarian Cancer Screening Study that was done of 78,000 women in the United States. This is just the ovarian piece of it. Women in this study were randomized to either getting an annual transvaginal ultrasound to look at their GYN organs and a CA125 blood test versus no screening. And the median follow-up of the study was 14 years. They found absolutely no difference in ovarian cancer-related mortality. You can see these lines are right on top of each other. And uh, if you are looking at a trial and you want to know if there's a difference, you want to be able to see some separation between those lines, right? And so they found an incidence of 38 versus 36 cases of ovarian cancer. And that's actually in the intervention versus the control versus out of 100 thousand person years in this study. So absolutely no difference. And they've looked at this at different points in time. They've done longer follow-up. And it seems to be completely negative. So no benefit of yearly C125 and vaginal ultrasounds. There's another even bigger trial that was done in the UK called UCTOX, or the UK, um, oh my gosh, it's cancer trial ovarian cancer screening. And they did over 200,000 women. This study cost a lot of money. We really wanted this to work. And here the women were randomized on three different arms of the trial. First, to a multimodality screening, which basically used something called the risk of ovarian cancer algorithm, which is looking at the trend in your CA125 blood level. So not the absolute number, but how it changes from draw to draw. And that can triage you to an ultrasound um, versus an annual ultrasound versus no screening. And they followed up these women for a median of 11 years and found, again, ovarian cancer mortality was basically 0.3% in all three arms. Now, you can see that if you look out towards the right side of the graph, you start to see a little bit of separation where maybe the women having multimodality screening start to do um, a little bit different than the other women, or the two screening groups versus the control group. So you can see the no screening arm here kind of start to increase ovarian cancer mortality late. It seems to split off a little bit. 
And the authors of this trial uh, did some reanalysis and think maybe this is a little bit positive eventually. They see a little bit, maybe a few, or, few more early stage ovarian cancers come up than later stage. And so if you actually ask the, um, Steve Skates, the lead author on this trial, he tells you this is a positive trial. Um, most of us otherwise don't interpret it this way. The primary outcome was ovarian cancer mortality. It is unchanged in all of the arms. Additionally, in the screening groups, almost 2,500 women underwent surgery based on their screening results. Of these, only 15% had cancer. So 85% of these 2,500 women are getting a surgery for a benign indication that was picked up on screening. And so that positive predictive value probably isn't good enough. There was even a, a cost analysis done for this that you know, because maybe with this reanalysis late, you see a little tiny bit of mortality reduction. And one estimate, banked on three quarters of a million dollars per person life year saved if we did this for everybody. So on the population basis, not only does this not work very well, but it's not cost effective, and it's not going to be reasonable to do annual screening in all of our low-risk women based on this trial. So who should get screening? An average risk woman. So someone without a particular pre-inherited disposition, such as the woman we're about to talk about. So a known genetic mutation or a first degree relative, family history, um, things like that. So those women, potentially there is some recommendation for screening and we'll go through that right now. So who should we screen? So uh, the recommendations for this are a little bit soft and they're not necessarily based on a ton of good data, but we feel like, and so therefore there are soft recommendations for, that women at a high enough risk might benefit from screening. And that goes back to what I was telling you earlier about the incidence in your population affects your positive predictive value of your test, right? So if you enrich your population to have more ovarian cancer, and then you do a screening test, you're more likely to find that that screening test is effective than in a lower risk population. And so we do use screening in these populations. For ovarian cancer, we offer screening to women with uh, BRCA, that's the breast and ovarian cancer family germline mutations, BRCA1 and 2, uh, possibly for some of the other mutations that might increase your risk of ovarian cancer. These are women with known genetic testing. Same thing for Lynch syndrome. So these are uh, mutations in the mismatch repair genes. These women are at elevated risk of ovarian cancer as well, and we screen them. And then there are some women with a strong family history but negative genetic testing for whom we also offer screening. Um, and basically the guideline here is that if we think your lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is around 10% or higher, then probably you fall into this category. Breast cancer alone um, with negative testing with no family history of ovarian cancer doesn't qualify you for ovarian cancer screening usually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it depends a little bit. I would individualize with your doctor probably around that. A lot of women with breast cancers that are hormonally driven anyway are getting surgery as an oophorectomy for that indication for hormonal suppression, and so they already have their risk prevention that way. So I think I would probably you know, individualize conversations. There are some soft guidelines in the literature about who might qualify and who wouldn't. It depends a little bit also on um, ancestry, such as Ashkenazi, Jewish heritage, things like that. Um, for endometrial cancer, only Lynch syndrome right now are who we are screening. So what are the screening recommendations? So for ovarian cancer prevention um, in BRCA, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network actually has a soft guideline um, about screening. So first, they're very clear that surgery is actually what is recommended for women with these germline mutations because surgery is known to be effective. And so we recommend what's called a risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy, so taking out the fallopian tubes and ovaries to reduce your risk of a future cancer, um, between the ages of 35 and 40 in BRCA1 after completion of childbearing. We delay a little bit in BRCA2 because the age of onset of these cancers is a little bit later. However, for those women who do not elect to have a risk-reducing salpingo-oophorectomy, as in they're delaying it until later or they choose not to have it at all, in that case, the patient and her physician can consider a screening strategy of um, CA125 along with a transvaginal ultrasound beginning around age 30 to 35 or 5 to 10 years before a family member's uh, incident ovarian cancer. There are similar recommendations both from the Society for Gynecological Oncology and the American College of OBGYN. And so this is uh, generally what seems to be recommended in the literature. 
for Lynch, um, obviously they need to be screened as well for ovarian cancer, but for the endometrial cancer, um, ACOG and SGO recommend an endometrial biopsy every one to two years starting around age 30 to 35, again, based on family history. Um, the ovarian cancer recommendations are less clear, but are generally used. And so most women end up getting both the endometrial biopsy as well as the ultrasound and CA125 as part of their screening strategy. ACOG and SGO also recommend a risk-reducing hysterectomy with bilateral salpingoophorectomy by the early to mid-40s after completion of childbearing for these women. And most of us, um, like I said, use both strategies for ovarian cancer screening and endometrial cancer screening in these women. There's a little bit of data about this. So the UK group really wanted their study to be positive, and so they also did a study in women with an estimated 10% or greater lifetime risk of ovarian cancer. There were 4,300 of them. They got a CA125, and um, that algorithm that trends your CA125 over time called the ROCA I mentioned earlier, every four months with an annual ultrasound. So it's a lot of blood draws. They followed them up for a median of almost five years. And in these 4,300 women, they they screened positive 13 cancers. They had six more women who had cancer detected incidentally on their risk-reducing salpingoophorectomy. So we do find some of those microscopic lesions when we do these preventative surgeries. To find these 13 cancers, 162 women had to have surgery. Um, and that's only 7.4% of the surgeries had cancer, even in an enriched population. They did see some stage shift, such that uh, women seem to have slightly earlier stage cancers in this group than in the general unscreened population. This was not a randomized trial because they didn't want to deny women the screening for this, so this was a single arm study. Interestingly, speaking of enriching your population, um, this is a table looking at the characteristics in the general screened population, so all of those women considered to be at higher risk versus only BRCA1 and 2 who are at the highest risk. And you can see that the percentage here, those undergoing surgery for a screen positive, 36% of the BRCA1 or 2 mutation carriers actually had a cancer compared to only 8% of the rest of the population. And so here's really another example where the more you enrich your population, the better your screening test is going to perform. And so this is part of why we offer screening to these women, because we believe that actually we might catch some cancers and catch some earlier stage cancers. And th this goes back to our positive predictive value. That's what PPV is here much higher, as you can see, in the BRCA compared to even the generally considered high-risk women. So these are the women with a family history but not a mutation, Lynch syndrome, et cetera, are lumped into that group. So how about surgery? Um, so surgery is absolutely what we actually recommend for these women, not screening. And so um, for BRCA, we recommend the bilateral salpingoophorectomy, so both fallopian tubes and ovaries. And uh, this has been studied. There are two really good studies for this that we quote. The first one was a prospective study of about 1,500 women that demonstrated a 72% risk in the re uh, a reduction in ovarian cancer, and that may translate into a 55% reduction in all-cause mortality for these women. That's how big of a deal this is. Additionally, in another survey, so this was post hoc, uh, 5,700 women with BRCA, they had an 80% reduction in ovarian cancer with a 77% reduction in all-cause mortality before age 70. There's not much else we can really offer in medicine to have this kind of a mortality reduction. So for these women, this is really important in life-saving surgery. In Lynch syndrome, again, less common and less well-studied, but there is one good study in 315 women um, and they compared women who had surgery and didn't and found that endometrial cancer developed in 0% of the women who had a hysterectomy, clearly, and 33% of those who didn't. And ovarian cancer was 0% versus 12%. Um, so I think, you know, surgery is really sort of much more effective than screening. And so that's why we really, as GYN oncologists, consider screening as something that we use as a bridge to surgery for women who haven't completed childbearing and to get them a few more years with all those benefits of having their ovaries in situ. You might ask why the reduction in ovarian cancer risk isn't zero in the BRCA population. Some of that is because women have um, incident tiny cancers that are found at their risk-reducing surgery. And some of it is also because there's a cousin of ovarian cancer called peritoneal cancer uh, that develops even sometimes in the absence of ovaries in these women. So there's still a few cases of those. So what can we conclude? Well, we can conclude that low-risk, asymptomatic women should not be screened for ovarian cancer and endometrial cancer. So no screening for these diseases. That being said, uh, we should be looking out for symptoms, and ACOG and SGO recommend us to do that so that we can catch this as soon as possible when symptoms do present. This is particularly useful, as we heard, in endometrial cancer, 
where I always like to say, if I could have one PSA, it would be that postmenopausal bleeding is never normal, right? Talk to your doctor. Select women, however, at elevated risk due to either germline genetic mutation or a strong family history can be offered screening. And I have this in quotes because we're not catching that pre-cancer, right? This isn't primary or secondary prevention. This is really tertiary prevention. We're trying to catch a cancer early before it can cause more morbidity. Um, but it's unclear, actually, that this saves lives. We don't really have any clear data that we save lives with screening. That being said, we do have data for saving lives with risk-reducing sur risk surgery. And so women at elevated risk of ovarian endometrial cancer should be offered risk-reduction surgery at the appropriate age uh, for them and for their families. Uh, it's, there's a whole sort of algorithm. There's, huh? How do you find strong family history? Um, so there's not sort of a clear definition, but basically um, the American College of OBGYN has a table of sort of guidelines that how many features you have that add up. So uh, for ovarian cancer, most of us consider a first degree relative to be a strong family history. Um, for breast cancer, to get to your ovarian cancer risk, uh, it's not quite as related, I think because breast cancer is so common and not all of the genes that are associated with breast cancer risk are necessarily also associated with ovarian cancer risk. Those are not the same. Um, and so for ovary, it's a little bit more straightforward. For endometrial cancer, uh, we don't tend to consider family history in quite a strong fashion, sort of quite a strong way, though there are specific guidelines in terms of colon cancer and endometrial cancer in your family that qualify you for testing for Lynch and that would then buy you into screening. Um, but if you were concerned about your family history, I, base, I would talk to your OBGYN to see if you qualify for genetic testing yourself, for one, a referral to a genetic counselor, and then to consider screening. Um, but in general, we do see women coming to us saying, I had a cousin with this or even a friend. Can I have an ultrasound? And I can tell you that as a GYN oncologist, I get a lot of referrals for incidental findings on on those ultrasounds, and that's how we go down these roads of surgeries that don't end up in cancer. So it's important to be really thoughtful when you're choosing your test. What do you recommend to women who wear ultramoxifen? So tamoxifen can increase the risk for endometrial cancer, and you as an OBGYN oncologist, do you do yearly ultrasound on that? No. What's the risk after they start Yeah. So the question is about um, tamoxifen and the risk of endometrial cancer. So we do know that tamoxifen increases the risk of endometrial cancer, a couple different types. Um, there actually have not been shown to be any benefit of like routine screening for those women either, actually. And so um, ACOG and SGO do not recommend routine screening for endometrial cancer of women on tamoxifen. That being said, uh, we do, again, any abnormal bleeding um, for postmenopausal women or premenopausal women changes to their bleeding, recommend immediate evaluation by an OBGYN to consider sampling. And is the risk decreasing after the women stop the tamoxifen? I think we don't have, I don't personally know of a great data about that, but yes, I think once you come off of it, we consider that your risk eventually goes back down to your baseline. That being said, if you bleed, you should see your doctor. <laughs>